focus on what you do want, not what you don't want. Because when you're making a hundred phone calls or whatever, it's very easy to start to focus on the people that hang up on you, reject you, say no to you. Quantity is important. The person who does more appointments is more times than not going to sell more. But if I can have quantity and quality, that's the way I want to go, right? Sales happen when you establish a need, you establish value because people don't buy just because of the price. They buy because of the value. And Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Walk to Wealth podcast. If you're tuning in on YouTube or any of the podcast directories, make sure to do yourself a favor and give us a follow. I don't want you to miss any of the amazing guests that we're bringing on this year. And I would hate for you to have FOMO. So do yourself a favor, give us a follow, and let's get right into this episode. Without further ado, uh, Michael, for anyone who hasn't got the opportunity to get to know you, tell us your elevator pitch. You know, who are you and what do you do? Yeah, hey, what's going on, John? Uh, so I'm excited to be here. I mean, there's a lot I could cover. Specifically, I'm on a mission right now uh, to help people with a, a passion or an expertise of some sort, oftentimes in the world of like health, uh, nutrition, fitness, or personal growth. Uh, turn that passion into a profitable and impactful six-figure online side gig for some people, seven-figure full-time business for many, but do it in a way that leads to uh, freedom, time, like time freedom, location freedom, and uh, personal freedom as well. And so uh, I have a whole background I could go into, but that's that's uh, that's that's where I spend a lot of my time right now. Amazing, Michael. Let, let's take a quick trip in a time machine. Take us back to little Michael when he was a kid. What was that like? What was it like growing up? Where did this entrepreneur start to originate? Yeah. Well, I know you said a lot of your listeners are maybe just getting into entrepreneurship or maybe want to start a business or, or things like that. So I think what might be relevant is that uh, as a kid, I was super serious and super shy. Yeah. Um, my, my, my parents jokingly said even as like six, seven, eight years old, I would have like worry lines and I was always so serious even as a little kid. Um, I asked to start karate at three years old. Um, at the time, the school that I trained at, they didn't let kids normally start karate till five, six, seven years old at the time. Um, but I, I was pretty serious about what I wanted to do. So I started karate when I was three. But uh, I mean, in general, in lines with like entrepreneurship, I was, I was pretty shy, pretty serious. And uh, at the same time, uh, a, a little with that shyness part, a little insecure as well. You know, when, when I started getting into middle school and the early years of high school, um, at times I felt really insecure and really uh, lacked confidence when it came to being around a lot of people. Yeah. I think that's something that a lot of people face, especially around that age group, because it's something where you're probably at the height of like peer pressure at <laughs> during that time. Let me ask you, does, did the insecurity fuel and in, in the lack of confidence fuel what you have going on today in the business in the industry that you decided to jump into? I think at one stage it did. Whether or not it was healthy fuel or it was continuous fuel, um, I, I do think it fueled me in one way because like I said, I started karate when I was three. I then competed for the next 20 something years. Uh, I won 10 national karate championships at 10 plus championships. And so I share that more for context in the sense that I was really competitive. And so the insecure part of me, and I grew up in a uh, above average income area, uh, but my mom's a teacher. And so we were basically, for the most part, in that town because it's where my mom taught. It's not. So I often have felt out of place when it came to like socioeconomics. It was a heavily Caucasian area. I was one of the few Asian kids uh, in the class. Right. So there are a lot of reasons why I felt like I didn't fit in or I felt like I was an outsider. I felt insecure. And so I think two things really drove me. One, I think, like you said, it's a heavy set of years of peer pressure and peer influence. And I really wanted to fit in. I really wanted to be loved, liked and accepted, which I think most of us desire that. But then you pair that with competitiveness. And I thought that the best way for me to be liked and loved is to win is to be really good at things. And so uh, I think that drove me, whether it was academically, whether it was, you know, getting nominated for school president or, or things like that, or whether it was finding ways to start working hard and making money or something. Uh, yeah, I think that I think that drove me at that stage for sure. No, definitely. And I, I love what you mentioned too, because a lot of times, even the people that try to convince themselves that they don't need anyone that they're cold hearted and they have that, you know, the typical high school alpha bravado of like, I'm too cool for everybody. I don't care about anyone. It's like, even those people, the only reason they're acting like that is because they weren't 
you know, accepted because they didn't fit in, because they weren't loved properly. And so now they're going to go out of their way to prove it to themselves that they don't need anyone. Yeah. But it all stems back from that internal desire, that innate desire that we all have in us to be accepted, to be felt, to feel like we are a part of the community. We're social creatures and it's not a bad thing. A lot of people try to yeah. knock it down. So let's segue into today's conversation a little bit. Talk to us about your, around 19, right? It's when you got first got started into the sales world, the business world, kind of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What was that like? Take us back to that experience. Where were you at mentally? What was the world like at that time? Uh, beer money. When, when's the next party? Uh, <laughs> hanging out with my friends, sleeping till noon. Shoot. I would sometimes, my mom's a high school teacher and I was home for freshman year of college break. And my mom would come home from a whole work day already. So school, high school ends at what? Two, three o'clock. Mm-hmm. She would get home at three or four o'clock and I'd still be sleeping. So you want to tell where my mindset was at the time? I, I was definitely not this like hot, overly mature. I'm going to be an entrepreneur, super focused. I was, you know, let's join a fraternity. Um, the competitive <laughs> side of me was like, I'm going to beat everybody at beer pong, you know, type of type of thing. So that's where my mentality was at 19. And I was working at Pizza Hut. And, you know, for me, Pizza Hut was a source for free breadsticks, easy work, and to me, beer and gas money. Um, but How it ties into entrepreneurship, John, is that uh, Pizza Hut wasn't paying the beer and gas money. It wasn't paying the bills, so to speak. And so I needed something that I was going to pay more. And I found my first sales job, uh, which admittedly, I kind of stunk at it initially. Again, shy. Uh, My mom's a teacher. My, uh, my My grandparents on both sides of the family are farmers. So they're very like laborers and hard work, which I'm grateful that was instilled with me. But I didn't have any role models per se close to me that were in sales or business or finance or entrepreneurship. And so sales was this new thing. In fact, I remember my my brother and sister kind of laughed at me. A lot of my friends and aunts and uncles kind of like, you know, jabbed at me a bit, laughed a bit when I got into it. And so I didn't have a ton of support. I didn't have a ton of natural skill. And I admittedly kind of stunk at it because I was still a bit of a shy kid. So that's what was going on at 19. Let me ask you, what, what kind of sales was it? Were you selling products, services? Were you on the phone? Were you knocking the doors, going neighborhood to neighborhood? What was that? What was it like that that experience? It was in home sales. It wasn't quite door to door, but it was in home. Like we would go to customers' homes, but we would set up those appointments via phone calls. Uh, so we'd randomly call people, get them to agree to an appointment for us to come into their home, and then John, we'd go into their home with a bag of knives. <laughs> we we were selling, I was selling knives and kitchen products uh, at the time. And so uh, it was in-home product sales, specifically kitchen products and knives. So kind of crazy because when you're 19, or at least when I was 19, I didn't know how to cook. I knew how to make ramen noodles. Um, so here I am with no sales experience, no experience with kitchen products, going to other people's homes, super shy, uh, trying to sell stuff to make money. Let me ask you a super quick question. How long did you spend in that in that sales position? Yeah. So the average person in that type of role probably lasts for like a couple weeks. It you know, a couple weeks, maybe a couple months is a long time. This this might shock you. Um, but I ended up staying at that company for eleven years. Really? So let me yeah. ask you the next question I really want to ask you is tell us what were some of the most valuable lessons you learned from first one is your first 100 sales of calls. And then the second one is your first 100th actual sales appointment. Man, there's so many lessons. And John, that 11 years ended up being some of the most for, like the most for, positively forming years of my life. I, I, I look back at those years and say, I got more education from those years selling products than I did spending $250,000 on a college education. Um, and I, I loved where I went to college. It was a top school in the country. Uh, but I, I think a lot of my success today is much largely in part to getting out there and doing sales. But to answer your actual question, um, what were the top lessons from the first hundred calls? Let's start with that first and foremost. Um, number one, uh, focus on what you do want, not what you don't want. Because when you're making 100 phone calls or, or, or whatever, it's very easy to start to focus on the people that hang up on you. Uh, reject you, say no to you, right? Uh, number two, if you're going to get into business, focus on how you can serve and how you can help people. Because the second you have what I call sales breath, people's guard goes up. 
And if you don't learn how to disarm people where they don't go, oh, just another sales guy, your likelihood of even getting a foot in the door, literally, it is pretty low. So focus on what you do want versus what you don't want. Um, focus on service, not just being salesy or you'll get you know rejected and resisted right away. Um, sales takes persistence. You know, a lot of the most successful people uh, at that role, I have two last lessons, this one and the next one. A lot of people at that role, the only reason they were more successful is because they were willing to make a thousand phone calls when the other person made 50, you know, they got hung up on or rejected or cursed at and so gave up, right? And so there's a level of persistence um, that that takes. And then like anything, uh, it, it takes skill. It's a skill that you want to actually develop. And I think people miss out on that in business. They just think it's all work ethic and, and I'm going to work hard. But if you think of the top athletes in the world, right, Kobe Bryant or Steph Curry, some of the greatest shooters of all time, you know, they talk about how a lot of their practices, they'll take a thousand shots. And if they miss one shot, they'll start back over until they make a hundred or 500 or a thousand shots straight. And my point in sharing that is that they're honing and crafting their skill. Most people just don't get great at entrepreneurship because they just run their head at the wall one time and don't continue to craft or hone that skill. So uh, I can answer some lessons about the hundred sales, but I figured I'd answer first the lessons from the hundred calls. If there's anything you want to speak to around that first. No, 100%, man. It's a part of putting the reps in. And if you want to fast track your growth, fast track your progress, it's how can you get more reps in within a shorter time frame, right? And more quality reps in if you want to take it even step further and just keep on putting, you know, you know, putting yourself in the oven and keep on baking and yeah. keep on just working on that craft. It's one of those things where it's hard because when it comes to sales, I still remember my first sales call experience. I was working at K Jewelers. And I remember, I think it was like sure for some like holiday event or something like that, man. And I, I just thought it was so kind of cringy, but it's like, they gave me this, like the, they printed out the script for me to read. And then after like call like 20 or 30, I was like, okay, I kind of memorized the script a little bit. So I added my own flavor to it. And then I was like, yeah. I kept still getting hung up, hung up on, but like, yeah. I, I started to improve a little bit. I started to make a little bit of progress. And my biggest sale that I made over the phone during that time at K, which is I think like eight months or so. I ended up selling two gold chains for like 4,000 bucks. It came up to like 3,800 or something like that. So that was like my biggest sale. It was a complete stranger, but someone that I, I cold called and it was like, oh, shoot. And I still remember, I have a photo. <laughs> actually, I have a photo wall up here. I still have, I have a photo from that day when I sold that necklace. As soon as he walked out, I was super excited because I almost lost that call. He wanted to, he wanted to get like a custom Cuban link chain. Like yeah. a, but a thick one. And that was probably going to run him close to like eight, maybe like six, seven, eight thousand or something like that. Yeah. And then I forgot what I said. I, I, I used the script. Oh, that's what it was. I was like, oh, you can get 25% off bridal, 20% off this. <laughs> da, 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 da. Yeah. You could also get 30% off gold. He was like, oh, wait, um, what was the last part? I was like 30% off gold. And the, the conversation started from there. And then we hit it off. Well, I followed yeah. up with him like twice because he didn't show up the day he said he was going to show up. And then we ended up finally making it work. So that was probably like my best like over the phone like sales experience during my time there. And it's something that like I still hold near and dear to my heart. So I, I mean, I love that you mentioned putting the reps in because it's not something that we're like normally taught to do, right? Yeah. It, it's yeah. sales calls or calls in general to strangers isn't a skill that is taught anywhere besides dialing and putting in the actual, you know, the calls in. So I, I love that. Let's shout it over. Right so now from your 100 sales appointment, because now, I mean, you were going indoor to people, as you mentioned. Yes. So now you're face to face with people. A lot of people can, you know, hop on Zoom now for sales appointments, but you're literally going up to people. As you said, you were shy. You had the personality <laughs> traits stacked against you, not in your favor. So it's yeah. like, what kind of shifts did you have to make there to start improving, to start closing better, to start even doing anything? Like, well, tell us about that process. Yeah, well, I think I had to focus on what establishes a sale, right? Because someone knows you, likes you, and trusts you. And for a while there, when I first got started, I thought being really successful at sales was about being charismatic and outgoing and funny, right? Because we see those guys on like infomercials that are high energy. And I have a lot of energy, but I'm not naturally like outgoing. I'm not naturally charismatic. I'm definitely not naturally like funny. That's not, I think, I don't think those are the natural words that people would first describe me as. But I did learn that I had to just be myself. I know that sounds cliche, but that's going to establish trust. In fact, I found 
that a lot of times the overly charismatic person sometimes creates sales resistance because the person comes across as so salesy. <coughs> so the fact that I was a little shy, um, I think just actually naturally created a little bit of trust. So that was number one. The second thing though, is while we talked about sales calls is all about putting in the reps, the actual sales appointments was now about forced multipliers or forced leverage, right? And so quantity is important. The person who does more appointments is more times than not going to sell more, more times than not. But if I can have quantity and quality, that's the way I want to go, right? Because if someone just has one quality appointment, but that's the only appointment they have, they're probably still going to get beat by the person that does a hundred appointments. But if I have a hundred quality appointments, I'm now going to beat the person that has a hundred low quality appointments. And so the second thing I learned was, I mean, a, a pretty typical phrase some people maybe have heard, but like, is not how to just work hard, but how to work smart, how to get referrals, how to get in front of the most qualified customers, how to get in front of like top notch leads. So if the person's not buying an average of $500, maybe they're spending $1,000 now, right? And so we're increasing average order here. And then the third thing that the, those appointments taught me uh, was how to build value, right? Sales really, sales happen when you create value. When you establish a need, you establish value because people don't buy just because of the price. They buy because of the value. And uh, that's something that I definitely learned from doing hundreds and hundreds of sales appointments. Let me ask you one quick question before we segue to the next topic. One of the things that I feel, at least for me personally, it took me a while to get over. So I know there's probably someone listening that might be struggling with this now, is that I didn't feel comfortable with high numbers. Like once it started talking about a couple hundred, it's like, okay, I can sell that. And then like yeah. 500 yeah. is like, oh, and then uh, over a thousand is like, oh, whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa. Yeah. What's going on here? This is like, so it's like, how do you get comfortable starting to sell some of these higher ticket items and higher priced items? A lot of time it's like most people treat these sales as commodities and they try to beat everyone on price. Yeah. How do you get comfortable in your own skin? Especially as you said, at that age where you were younger, you're starting in sales pretty early. They don't have much sales experience or any sales experience coming into it. How does one get comfortable selling? Mm. Yeah. So there's not one right way uh, per se, depending on the person or the situation. But uh, I think the first thing is, is to put yourself in their shoes. And a lot of times when I was 19 selling a 49 year old knives, yeah, in the back of my head, I was like, they're going to buy a set of knives for a thousand dollars. Remember, I was the kid who was just working at Pizza Hut just 30 days ago, you know, trying to make enough money to just get a 30 pack and a, and a tank of gas, right? So $1,000, like, shoot, I, I, could, I could go all month. I could maybe go all summer on $1,000. You're going to spend it on just a set of knives. So it was really important that I put myself in their shoes, not my shoes, uh, especially when someone's first getting started in sales and they're 18, 19, 20, 22 years old. You know, we're thinking about things from our perspective of the world when we need to see it from the perspective of the person that we're selling to. The second way that somebody could do that is to normalize just how much money our specific ideal client actually spent, right? And so whether that's paying attention to a typical 39 or, or 62 or however old the person is that we're selling something to, pay attention to how much money they actually spend and then how little the thing we're selling to them actually pales in comparison to how much money they spend throughout a year. I could pay attention to how much shoes are, right? Or how much uh, a private school tuition is, or how much a car is, right? Or how much somebody just spends on going out to dinner. I mean, shoot, when I was that age, if I could get a free meal, that was the best meal out there. But then the more I started to make money myself or see other people spending money, John, I've seen people spend $1,000 at dinner with four people, you know? For, for one night of food and then it's gone the next day. So the second thing is I really had to normalize just how much money people really are or were spending, not from my perspective, but from the perspective of the person that I'm going to see. And then lastly, something that really helped me out because I'm a numbers person is to break down the big number into little chunks, especially when there's financing, especially when there's payment plans. Because you know, if someone were to say to you, is a million dollars a lot of money? Most people would say yes. But if I said I was going to give you a million dollars, right, over the next hundred years, is that really a lot of money? 
especially if that's what you're going to get paid? The answer would be no, because now you're getting what? $10,000 a year? $10,000 a year is below poverty, right? That's $833 a month in, in pay, right? Most people can't live on $833 a month in pay. And so to break down big numbers into smaller bite-sized chunks really helped me out as well. So even if I'm selling something for $1,000, but I'm able to break it up into a five-month payment plan, that's $200 a month. That's $50 a week, right? That's actually not that big of a deal at $50 a week. So those are some of the ways I started to normalize bigger ticket prices. Now, I love that. I mean, all the advice was solid, but that last one really hits home because, and that's exactly what I did. I had to break down these numbers into numbers that I could comp- comprehend, into numbers that I could grasp. And yeah. then casually, I mean, not casually, gradually, it started to become more and more normalized as I started master money more, as I started connecting with more and more people. Yeah. Now, let me ask, because you mentioned too in your beginning of your story that both your grandparents on both your parents' side, both were farmers, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. correct? Yeah. You've yeah. been able to cross a seven-figure threshold already multiple times. What was it like that first time, though, knowing that yeah. you, you, you made it to a milestone where not a lot of entrepreneurs ever make it past? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was weird. You know, I, what I mean by that is it's, it's more normal. I'm glad you asked because it's more normal today. Um, I'm now running my fifth seven figure company. Uh, the company I run today was one of Inc. 5000's fastest growing companies in America last year. So it is a little more normal to me today. But when you bring me back to that very, very first time, it was weird. And what, what I mean by weird, it was a really big deal in my own heart and my own mind. Um, and weird in a way that it was such a big deal. I, I, I subconsciously, John, questioned like if my family would still be proud of me or if they would think I was like, there was this inside part of me that's like, oh man, people are going to think I'm, I now think I'm too good for them or they're, they're going to now think I'm like the arrogant rich guy. And so it was really weird wanting to like be proud of what I accomplished, but also feeling scared and nervous that people that I love were actually going to judge me for my success. So it's a really, you know, weird dichotomy or a weird type of situation to be in sometimes, which might sound easier said than done until somebody actually achieves their first seven figures and they didn't grow up around a ton of money. And people start making comments or people start thinking, oh, like people used to call me at that age. I remember friends from high school would start calling me, oh, 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 they would call me CEO. Then I got look at you, CEO. They would call me big shot. But it was, oh, you, at least how I felt, like it always felt like they were saying it with a little bit of sarcasm, a little bit of resentment, yeah. a little bit of judgment. And that was really art. No, man, I, I love that because, I mean, not that you have to experience it, but like the <laughs> fact that you have to share that, you know, because yeah. I feel like a lot of times, even with me, when I got into entrepreneurship, now, I'm still figuring out this role. I'm on the other opposite side of the spectrum right now where I'm still getting the, the ball rolling. But even just jumping into entrepreneurship, like my grandparents used to say, oh, mira, licenciado, which in Spanish translates to, oh, look, the licensed guy, because I got licensed as a realtor. And so it's <laughs> like, but there was always that hint of sarcasm you could tell behind yeah. it. There was because I dropped out of college. I decided to go to untraditional track. And my family, I was like the golden child. I never got in trouble, had the best grades out of all my cousins and stuff like that. Like everyone knew in the family, like, yeah, John is going to be the one to graduate college. He's going to be the one. And it's just like, I didn't end up going the track that they, I mean, I'm still going to be the one, just not the college graduate. Yeah. Someone else can have that hat. I'm going the entrepreneurship route. But when I decided to go the entrepreneurship route and was like, man, they were, they were like, everyone was asking why and they didn't understand. And I kind of experienced a similar thing where they were like, have that little bit of sarcasm and yeah. in that, in that undertone. And it was just like, wow. So I want to ask, because this, this is a topic I've been seeing on like Instagram a lot recently in reels and videos, and it's called the the weight of gold, right? Everyone talks about the fear uh, of failure. A lot of people have a fear of, of success for this exact reason. And yeah. there's a documentary that I still yet to watch, but I need to watch, called The Fear of Success. I mean, uh, the, the weight of gold. And it pretty much talks about all the stuff that comes with success. So, I mean, if you don't mind going a little bit deeper, what else was it like, you know, crossing that threshold now that, yeah. you know, um, when they, and engaging with people in that were from your past world, your past life prior to you finding yeah. out that success. What was that like? What are some of the things that the dark side, I guess you could say, that came with the seven-figure title or that came with the success? Yeah. 
man, I mean, this by itself could be the whole podcast <laughs> because I think if people understood the the stories and the emotions that come with success, they could either be more prepared for it. But I think the first thing to understand from my understanding, from my perspective is that we're not wired as human beings to be successful, like biologically, like at our core, right? We are wired as human beings to be loved and accepted because we're pack animals by nature. And so yet here we are in the Western civilization where success is such a big part of what everybody wants, whether that's fame or finances or materialism or whatever. And yet it goes directly against sometimes how we're naturally wired and that's to be liked, loved and accepted. And so when we can understand that, we can understand the number one hack to actually becoming successful more easily. Again, when we can understand that we're wired to be liked, loved, and accepted, we can actually hack our ability to become successful easier and faster. And John, what do you think that is? Right? My guess is masterminds. That's my guess. Masterminds are, fall under the banner of the answer I was going to give, and that's leveling up your circle of influence. Masterminds are one of the ways to get there, right? Because here's the deal. If all of my friends and family members have never made six figures, let's just say, and I make seven figures. I'm going to feel like I don't fit in anymore. So I'm either going to A, end up abandoning them, or B, I'm going to self-sabotage my own success financially. But what if all of my friends and, and the majority of the people that I spend time with the most, what if they all make seven figures and I only make six figures? If I want to be liked and accepted by them, I'm going to find a way to level things up. If they all have a six pack and are in good shape and you know prioritize their health and I'm over here like, drinking too much and not to, I'm going to find a way to be more like them because I want to be accepted. I want to fit in. I want to be liked. And so I think the sooner we can understand that, the, the, I don't want to say it never becomes easy because sometimes that means making hard decisions, but the more simple we can turn success in our brain when we can understand it starts there. Yeah. It's one of those things where the difference between, between someone that's super smart and super wise is by how simply they can explain a concept or a idea and still get the same overall message across. And I love how you put it because it was one of those things where it's back to that old quote of, you, you know, you're the fifth person at the, t the table of millionaires, you'll become a millionaire if you're the fifth tip person. And people really don't understand how important it is that they audit the people they spend time with, yeah. that they audit the people and what they're doing and where they're headed. And it is okay to take a step back, to unwind a little bit, to unwire a little bit, because not everyone's on the same mission. And not to say that your mission is better than anyone else's, but just to say that it's not the same. And finding, as you said, that's why I love conferences so much, man. Yeah. And I've been spending a lot more money investing in myself, partly just because I just want to be around people that understand. And it's it's something, as you said, we all want to fit in. I mean, no one wants to be alone, no matter, as I said earlier, even that bravado of, hey, I don't need anybody. It's all a, it's all a cover up. And I, I love this advice. So let me ask you now. So you, you found your let me, you before you, before you ask, yeah. before you ask the next question, can I touch on one other last thing real quick? Yeah, of course. Yeah. You're, you're asking about those things. So I talked about how like we're wired to be loved and accepted, but it's not always easy. I want to make sure any listener is clear on that. Right. You know, cause I could understand that concept, but there are certain people's judgment and approval that are harder to overcome. And one set of people that are harder to overcome for most people are the approval of our parents. You know, and I remember um, when I was trying to make $100,000 in a month and I just could not do it, but it's not like I was far off. I made 98K in a month. I made 92K in a month. I made 95K in a month, but I could not break $100,000 in a month. And so naturally I was like, I just got to work harder. I just got to figure out a better strategy. But there came a point where I was like, it can't be work ethic. I'm literally doing 98K a month. Why can't I break through 100? And sometimes success and what we create in life is really just all about what's going on up here. And I wanted to share this story because what I ended up discovering for myself is that I was almost self-sabotaging my own ability to break 100K. And my definition, John, of self-sabotage is really wanting something externally whether it's a car or a relationship, money, whatever, but having a conflicting belief internally to the thing that you say you want. For example, if somebody keeps saying, I want a relationship so badly, I want to find a girl, I want to whatever, right? But if internally they believe that relationships are going to equal loss of freedom, 
pain, someone cheating on you, whatever, you might keep repelling away a good relationship. Well, that's what I did with $100,000 in earnings for the month, because here's why. I remember as a kid, I used to hear my dad kind of like resentfully make jabs at people that made six figures in a year. So in my brain, I was like, if my dad resents people who make six figures in a year, what is he going to think about me if I make six figures in a month? And I remember what I had to work through, John, is I basically had to ask myself and emotionally believe, will my dad still love me? And I know that sounds kind of crazy to some people. Some people are like, my dad would freaking give me a high five and take me out for a drink. I was scared that he wouldn't actually be proud and that he wouldn't accept me and that he wouldn't like me. It's probably the same reason I don't have a tattoo today. Because my dad used to growing up all the time, just be like, don't get a tattoo, don't get a tattoo. So here I am not with a tattoo because my dad used to say that, but it also started to get in the way of me achieving certain things I wanted because I cared about his approval more than I actually cared about getting the thing that I thought I wanted. Once I healed that, the crazy part is, John, we've done over $100,000 in a month every single month since that month, since I figured that out for the last three and a half years. <laughs> that is amazing. And I've been looking a lot into storytelling recently. And one of the parts of the hero's journey that talks about is the atonement of the father. And you can't, the hero can't progress in their journey until their father, father dies. And not their actual father, but in metaphor, metaphorically, yeah. the person who has the most control over their life, whether that is a parent, a grandparent, someone who had custody over you, a godparent, a friend, a girlfriend, a spouse, whatever it may be, until that person dies, not literally, metaphorically, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot, at least a hero cannot proceed on the journey. Yeah. He cannot make it to the end. And so that's kind of the exact moment that you kind of just had. Yeah. And you had to have that die off so that you can yeah. get into that place. And so let me ask you now, because a yeah. hundred figure, a hundred thousand in a month is something that's so hard to grasp. And a lot of times in the gym, because a lot of people probably resonate with this more. Sure. But let's say they try to break 200 on the bench. Right. Or for me, I'll use me. I couldn't pass 400 of the deadlifts. I never ended up doing it because I ended up switching to calisthenics, but I was stuck at 400 and I'm about like 175. So this is more than double my body weight. So I was sure it was pretty high, but it, I couldn't break 400 for whatever reason. And my friend would do it easily. Like he was so pushing close to 500 and he was about like, uh, like 15 pounds heavier than I was like close to like 15, 20, which in weightlifting is a lot, but yeah, still like, lot. man, like he, he's over there pushing it, but it, it got me fired up to the point when like, I, I was willing to attempt it. And was there someone like that in your life that was just like, man, they just inspired you? Not in a way like, oh, I got to hit it because I got to keep up with them. But like in a way like, man, they're just thriving. They're just keeping it going. Like, was there someone like that in your life that kind of just helped to push you to these further heights? Yeah, tons. You know, I, I, I credit so much of my success to others around me. Uh, I don't think I am naturally talented at almost anything that I choose to get into, right? Um, I was oftentimes really bad at a lot of things I started at, but the inspiration of the, of the example of other people ahead of me, there's one thing that I, I, I am great at, and that is that I will figure it out and I won't give up, right? And so then I will end up getting good at it. But to answer your question, tons, man, the inspiration and the example of, of other role models, whether directly as role models and mentors or indirectly watching someone else you know, as, as an example has been a huge part of how I succeed. I believe not everyone's like this. some people are the I'm going to go be the revolutionary and do it for the first time. I'm the like, show me that it's possible and then I will find a way to do it as good as that person, if not better. So to answer your question, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so now let me ask you, right? So now you made it to the other side of the of the spectrum, I guess. You're you're doing 100K months for the past three plus years straight. And you're, this is what it looks like. So you need to keep on going. What does life, like what's that driver in you? What's that thing that keeps you going? That thing that keeps you striving after? Because a lot of people, they fail to realize that the summit isn't the end all be all. It's the trek up okay. the summit that is more important. So what what is it for you, man, that it just keeps you going, that keeps you motivated, that keeps you working so hard? When you've already reached things that some people can only imagine and dream of. Yeah. Um, I think that answer probably changes over time. And uh, I probably reserve the right if I were to ever come back on your show one or three or five years from now to maybe say something different. But uh, I think fundamentally, the answer that will probably almost always be the case is that 
growth, like continuous growth, is the only true safe space, right? Or or John Maxwell would put it as like, um, like growth is a lifetime journey, not a destination journey. And I've just found that I am happiest on the pursuit of something or on the progression of something, not at the actual arrival of it. Right? When I think back at winning karate championships as an example, I remember more long nights, late nights, practices, right? Hard days, k- training camps. Like I remember more of that, admittedly, than I remember the actual competition itself. Then I actually remember like winning a trophy or something like that. Um, and I think that just points to the fact that most of us as human beings are thriving and more fulfilled during the actual progression or process of something, not the actual outcome. And so I just choose to want to be happy. And I know that for me to be happy, I need to constantly be evolving and growing. Yeah. Now, that is such a amazing point. And it's something I, when I look back on too, like I, I remember so many nights like days like walking to football practice. And for me, my high school was almost like two miles away. And football season in, in the Northeast, it gets pretty chilly towards the Thanksgiving months. So yeah, I, I remember like walking with pads, walking with the guys. We would sometimes walk back after practice. And yeah. like sometimes for summer workouts, we would have to go and it's like 95 degrees and we're doing bear crawls and full pads on the freaking hot turf. And it's like, yeah. those those were the times and the memories that I mean, honestly, I would go back and live twice any, you know, any, you know, any chance I got because it was, I, I don't know, man. It, it's just like just being in the, in the, in the gutter of it, being in the thick of it is, is, I mean, it doesn't seem like fun kind of when you're going through it, but like looking back at it, man, it's like, you know, it, it is, it, it's super, you know, amazing to just look back at and just reflect on sometimes and just like, well, we, we made it through, but probably at that time was like, man, I hate these coaches. Like, yeah. I don't want to yeah. be here, right? And it's one of those things. Let me ask you now. Where where in the I'm, Northeast? I'm I'm in Connecticut. So it's not like oh. frigid cold like Maine, but it's like it gets pretty chilly. I'm from Jersey. That's why I asked. Oh, really, man? Yeah. It's one of those things where I got a, a lot of family from out in Patterson. Uh, I, that's yeah. big Dominican hub over in Patterson. Yeah. There's so many yeah. Dominican people over there. Yeah. Let me ask you, right? Where can people connect with you at? You dropped a ton of amazing nuggets and you made it. I love how just down to earth a lot of it was and stuff like you're just another guy like most of us that, hey, you, you know, you're out, you know, you're partying, you're having fun, you're living life and you got an opportunity and you made the most of it and you've been catching your stride since and you're now you're you're dropping back a lot of gems on these shows. So where could we connect with you at? Where could we find you at if anyone wanted to connect with you, work with you or just even just keep up with more of what you got going on? Yeah, Instagram or Facebook are probably like the easiest ways just to connect. On Instagram, my handle's Mike two underscores Chew. Um, so that's where I'm on, on Instagram, Michael Chew on Facebook. If you're specifically an online coach or, or wanting to be an online coach of any sort, whether it's a fitness trainer, nutritionist, you know, all different types of coaches like that, um, we have a we have one of the one of the most valuable free Facebook communities for people uh, like that called Seven Figure Fit Pro. And then if you already have an established business, I also have a gift that I give anybody who's already running some sort of small business and they could just go to www.champdev.com backslash free. And on on that is a three-part training of how we help our students unlock anywhere from $100,000 to a million dollars in back-end profit with our LTV method. And so there's a full in-depth training on there of how somebody could go implement that into their own lives. Just go to www.champdev.com backslash free. But uh, Instagram or Facebook's the easiest way just to connect, follow, and stay in touch. Amazing, man. And now it's time for our famous five questions. The question we ask every single guest on the show. Question number one, what is the most impactful lesson you've learned in life? Now, the feelings are meant to be felt. You know, um, growing up as an A-type personality in an Asian family, and I only say Asian in the sense that I think a lot of races are like this, but... Asian specifically, it's like, grow up, be a big boy, like stop crying, right? Be tough and stuff like that. And so uh, I wasn't trained to feel a lot of feelings. You know, life wasn't always just sunshine and rainbows for me. I grew up in a family of alcoholics and um, feeling feelings was not something that came natural to me. And, and why this has ended up being one of the biggest lessons is by not learning how to feel my feelings, I could get by for a while. But at some point, what we resist persists, and then sometimes it explodes. And for me, when I would bottle up emotions 
explosions, especially when you pair alcohol with it, would sometimes lead to like saying stupid shit to people I love or trying to start a fight or or punching a wall or things like that. It's probably a huge reason why I gave up alcohol forever, uh, almost four years ago now. But um, in line with that journey, I also learned how to process and feel and attend to what I'm actually feeling and how, how to summarize the lesson, John. True masculinity or true strength is knowing how to feel your feelings. And I used to think strength was like, no, I'm good. No, true strength is knowing how to feel deeply whatever you're feeling, whether it's sadness, whether it's jealousy, whether it's scared, whether it's anger, whether it's stress, and knowing how to feel that and process that in a really healthy way. And that's amazing, man. What is the most admirable trait a person can have? Integrity, you know. Integrity in a lot of ways, because you follow through on what you're actually saying you're going to do. But integrity is one of those things, in my opinion, that it's easy for most people to be like, yeah, I'm going to be an honest person. But the truth is, the more I've been around people, human beings will violate their values. They might value truth, but they'll va- violate their values to meet a need. And if we don't feel safe, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get in trouble, we'll lie, we'll omit. And so to, to truly be able to embody the characteristic of, of integrity uh, is a truly admirable trait because most of us will compromise integrity to make a little money, to not have someone mad at us, to get someone to like us, you know, and or, or break our own integrity with ourselves because it's easier to go watch TV right now. It's easier to do whatever. Um, by no means am I perfect at it, but for the last half a decade, a commitment to, of mine is to be a man of integrity, um, even when it's hard. If you want to get into my phone, my password is uh, integrity. And um, yeah, for that reason, I think that is one of the uh, most admirable, admirable characteristics. If you had to change someone's life with one book, which book would you recommend? I guess it would depend on really what they're looking for. But um, I'm going to, I know if, I know when people are on shows, like, I'm not going to answer the actual question you answered because I'm going to, instead of one, I'm going to give you two. But two that come to mind, the, the one, if I had to give the answer of one, it would be Thinking Grow Rich by Napoleon. I think it's a classic, an oldie and a goodie, uh, but a more modern day version uh, that I think honors more the Western civilization and the Western culture today uh, would be The Happiness Advantage. And that book by Sean Aker goes deeply into, is going to achieve, is achieving and becoming successful actually going to make us happy? Or does learning how to become a happy person, is that actually what's going to lead to success? And I think it's really a, uh, a, a foundational book for people who want to feel fulfilled, not just successful. What is the legacy that you're trying to leave behind? Sure. That's a, a beautiful question and one that I'm still trying to get clear on. Um, you know, as a dad of two young girls, um, I, I, I've been asking myself a lot, like, what's the legacy that I'm going to leave uh, behind for them? But one of the legacies that I believe I do want to leave behind is that I inspire others to champion uh, the greatest love, abundance, and glory that their life is meant for. And I think so many of us don't believe we're actually meant to be loved or we're never in a space where it feels safe that we're fully accepted. Uh, we live in a world that's so easy to focus on scarcity, not abundance, and we'll start to settle for our limitations instead of fighting for our possibilities. Uh, and then we end up living a life lesser than one that we feel proud of. So if I can help others champion a life of love, abundance, and glory, uh, that feels like the the mission and the purpose uh, and the legacy that I want to leave behind for others. And for anyone that wants to embark on their walk to wealth today, what is the first step you recommend they take? Develop, d- d- if it's specifically the walk to wealth, develop high income skills. You know, we, we grew up in a world... <sighs> We, we, we're in a society. I can't say we grew up in a world, but we're in a society where there's still a push for education, like formal education. But I think it's Jim Rohn or Brian Tracy that says uh, we're going to make a, a living from formal education, but we're going to make a, we're going to build wealth because of self education. And if one doesn't develop high income skills, how to sell something, how to build something, how to lead people, the chances of them building wealth are are, are pretty low, unless it's maybe just handed to them. Um, so develop high income producing skills. And that is making amazing. And I had a great time interviewing you, as I said earlier, you dropped a lot of valuable nuggets and I'm just super you know, honored to have had you on the show. I know it's been a while since we last caught up. And yeah. I, I'm glad we were able to put this together and get something on the, for the books. And 
just any way I could help, man. Uh, your story is super touching. I wish you would have probably got more into the the you know the, the alcoholism in, in the beginning too, because that's super powerful, man. Overcoming yeah. that, and I mean that probably could have been its own separate episode. So that's <laughs> collabs in the future, man. A collab yeah. in the future. We definitely got to bring you back. I appreciate it, John. There was a lot of fun. All right, take care. Talk to you soon.